All right. Well, there's not quite as many of us this morning as there was last week, but we're excited to gather together and, and worship. So if you would stand with us as we start. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. We're sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. seated. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here in person and those that are joining us online. It's good to worship together. And this is our year of Jubilee. And we don't want to miss sharing the good news of all that God is doing here amongst our midst at Northridge. We also would be remiss if we didn't take an opportunity just one more time to recognize Glenda and Jared and Joy and all the many people, whether it's the people in the parking lot making sure our cars were safe or the coffee bar or pouring water and tea for us in the kitchen. Just give a round of applause for all the people that made last week so great. It was a wonderful celebration. Just a couple of announcements, and there's a few things that you'll want to um, look at your bulletin and, and make sure that you're connected with. I'm just going to highlight a few things. Our Family Promise Host Week uh, begins this week, so just be in prayer for our families as they're here. 
And um, as many, many people um, in, our, uh, in our body are serving in those capacities this week, we will have a business meeting next Sunday evening at 5 p.m. Again, that's a little different time than what we've normally done things, um, but that's really um, intentional so that we can come together as a congregation and then um, not overlap and, and uh, mess up the youth program that happens that evening. So there's a number of the leadership team that are involved in there, and then that gives them the opportunity to come and join us, come and join us, and then be able to go on to uh, youth. So um, 5 o'clock next Sunday evening, we will be... Um, there are several things that will be on the agenda, but we want to make sure and take that time to pray for our team that will be going to Mexico. And we're also going to use that time to hear from Kevin and Melissa about their recent trip to Africa. And they'll be talking a little bit about uh, what happened there. I'm going to invite um, Eli up for just a moment to uh, give an announcement about our Mexico trip. So I wanted to take a second and update everyone. We raised $8,663. Uh, for spring invasion, which is uh, it's amazing, and I, I want to just personally just say thank you from the people that donated food for that, the people that hired the youth, and the people that just gave. It's just amazing and encouraging and supportive um, as the new guy coming in to work with the youth to see the level of um, generosity given towards the youth program. And so then I also wanted to just offer three ways that you could pray for us um, as we're moving forward. So the first one is uh, obviously safety and travel. We'd like to get there and back safely. Um, the second one is just grace for us to have with each other. Um, as we're traveling there, spending, you know, 24 hours a day with the same people. And then last, enthusiasm for the people that we'll be entering in ministry with. Um, so those, those three things. Um, and with that, if you will stand and just greet your neighbor um, this morning. Thank you. All right, this first song we're going to sing is called Battle Belongs. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moved. When I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Let's sing that again. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear now for I am safe with you so when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to you and 
every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if you are for me, who can be against me? And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. fortress and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God you shine in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power with all the things happening in this world, um, all the things that are happening with, for people in this room, Lord, uh, what a great hope it is um, to be able to look to you in these battles, that we can come to you and that you will fight on our behalf. Lord, we love you. You're so good to us. You give hope, 
you restore every heart that is broken and great are you lord you give life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore So shout your praise. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will
great. You are so worthy of us gathering together this morning um, to hear from your word, to sing these songs, um, to break up into groups and discuss your word more. Uh, we're so thankful for this place, uh, these people, uh, 50 years and going. Um, and uh, we just thank you for this morning. We just ask that you would continue to uh, be present and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good. Welcome back. Um, if, if you've been unconscious for the last month or so, or you haven't been here, um, we're doing this Immerse series, and this is on, on the kingdoms, right? We started with uh, Joshua and the transition in leadership and God using him, and then Judges and Ruth. And we've kind of had uh, a lot of discussion. I hope you guys have had good discussion in your groups as we've had in, in the group I've been a part of. Uh, but just to, to kind of catch up again, welcome back to the state of Israel. Okay, We just celebrated our 50 years. Welcome back to, to where we've been focusing here, right? This kind of sounds like today, modern day, doesn't it? War, occupation by enemies. Leaders only concerned with their own gain. Trauma and tragedy all around. And yet, and yet, there's hope. And that's what I want to, I want to really see today, is God brings us hope. Even in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of the, the nonsense that we see, there is hope. Amen. So um, let's let's jump into it. In First Samuel um, one through twenty was a section. I hope you guys read. Um, there's a there's a tremendous amount of stories here. We've got you know some of your all time favorites. Some of the ones that Jody teaches our kids fantastically. Uh, you know David and Goliath, right? Samuel gets his calling uh, as a young child. You got all these these wonderful things. Um, but let's. Let's kind of hammer through some of these because I don't think you guys want to have me spend enough time as it takes for you to scroll through your full Facebook feed. Uh, we'll just run through this fast. Uh, you can see there, Hannah pleads her plight to the Lord. Right? Hannah's in this desperate situation. She feels miserable. She can't have kids. Her husband has two wives. I mean, that's enough to make you feel miserable, right? <coughs> so... She can't have kids. Well, then, not to mention, the other wife is there just haunting her. as a menace. So what does she do with that? Well, first, she internalizes it a whole bunch and just weeping. She doesn't eat. If you read that, you recognize there's some, some serious depression going on here. Okay, and, and understandably so, right? Rightfully so. But here's where she turns, and here's where the story takes a real turn. If I just stay stuck with myself, if I just focus on, ugh, it's ugly. But when I turn and I pivot and I look to the cross, which we have up there, if I look to God, then I see there's hope. And Hannah goes and, he, and she pleads at the temple, the tabernacle, uh, and Eli of course, you have this, this character. The Lord chooses to bless her in spite of who's running the tabernacle. In spite of the, the leaders, again, only concerned with their own gain. That doesn't limit God. Don't think that you can't pursue righteousness, that you can't be reached by God because the knucklehead in control doesn't limit him. 
Anyway, <clears throat> so through that, God's not content to leave Knucklehead in control. We see God raises up. God provides Samuel, right? Samuel is not just an answer for Hannah. Samuel is an answer for his people, for God's chosen. But he also takes the place of those who are not doing their job. So there's some caution in there, right? You got to listen and go, hmm. Pursue the Lord 100%. So the priest's failure to lead the people righteously follow, the, to righteously follow the Lord leads to their obvious correction, okay? <laughs> the ark of the Lord's captured. I shouldn't laugh at that, but I think it's really actually pretty funny. If when you've done the reading, and hopefully all of you have, uh, you see that the, the ark of God, which is the, the symbol, it's kind of the token, it's not God, but that's where he's chosen to meet with his people. You have the symbol that's taken, and it gets thrown into this pagan temple, and what happens, right? The pagan god falls over. And they're like, oh, okay, so it's bound down to their god. Well, we don't like that. That's our god, and we need to stand him back up. And then the next night, the same thing happens again, except it breaks into pieces. So they're like, well, we can't have this. Not to mention tumors are breaking out. People are dying. They're like, whoa, let's send it to the next city. Right? <laughs> Great leadership, right? Let's send it over to them. And again, like, well, we don't want it. That's tearing up our town. God's against us, right? So they're shuffling it on, and pretty soon, as soon as it gets to the third town, third town's like, look, we're smarter than you guys, apparently. So we don't want that thing in here. Figure out what to do with it, but don't bring it to our town. And so they, they actually, uh, I'm taking too much time. They're, uh, they send it back to, back to the land of Israel. <clears throat> but in the midst of that, God raises up Samuel again. He raises up another, another judge. And, and Samuel rescues the people. There's another, another conflict, another war. Uh, you know, another battle rages. It still looks a whole lot like where we just were in Judges, right? It's chaos, turmoil. Uh, there's no, no real uh, clear leadership until God pops his one, one guy up, right? And then everybody still kind of does what's right in their own eyes. And you have this messed up, messed up place. But in all of this, there's still a remnant. In all this, God still has his faithful people that flow through. So that's kind of the end of an era. 1 Samuel 10, 17 to 19 says, Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt. You remember that. And it's interesting because even the enemies of the Lord, even these other nations around, Look, when they bring the, the ark in, they're like, oh, man. This, <laughs> we can't do this. They brought their God in. You know he wiped out Egypt. You know he dried up the, the river. You know they wiped out, like, everybody. We can't handle this. But the problem is that the people of Israel weren't faithful. God's not faithful. It's not like he lost power. It's not like he's like, oh, man, this is my week for vacation. I really can't, can't swing that. No, he's calling everyone to himself. And when he shows his power through tearing down these kingdoms, it's not, it's not because uh, one person is better than another. It's because one person's heart is tuned to his and another's needs to be turned. So listen to that voice. Is your heart tuned or do you need turned? So Samuel says, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt. I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But now you have rejected your God who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. That sounds really good. 
and, uh, and you have said, no, appoint us a king. So now Samuel says, all right, come on forward. We'll get this all sorted out. Okay, and then you have that whole selection process. But before that even happens, I want you to hear this from uh, chapter 8. The Lord told Samuel, he said, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now, listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his right. You think you want a king? It's not going to be pretty. So you can see, I say this is the end of an era, but it's really, it's kind of more of the same, isn't it? It's more of the same. We don't, you know, when, when they're standing at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai and they said, hey, Moses, you go ahead, because I mean, that's a really scary voice, and I don't like it when the earth shakes underneath me. You go talk to God, because he'll, he'll kill us if, if we uh, stay here and try to do this ourselves. I think God's design was the one-on-one -on -one the whole time. Isn't that how he created the garden? He wants that fellowship, that one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what we see in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit comes, right? It's that one-on-one -on -one connection. God's not looking for an intermediary for you. He's not looking for you to have me stand up here and be the voice of God to you. He's speaking. Are you listening? Is your heart tuned or does it need turned? But they become under new management. Okay, You can see Saul the king. Saul comes in. We could talk a lot about that. He's really people-oriented. When I saw the men scattering and you did not come, talking to Samuel, he said, I felt, felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. And you see it again in chapter 15. He says, I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. Here's your king, the king you wanted. He's trying to please you. Never a good combo. Jonathan the prince. He's a soldier, but he's so God-focused. I love watching him as he goes through this. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And you kind of see that even in, in David, the future, but not yet king. He's a shepherd. He's anointed. And then when you see David and Goliath, where does he come from? His dad's like, hey, come in from the fields. You need to go help your brothers. Go bring them some food. Take them some snacks. Right? Take the Cheetos. He's like, he's still low man on the totem pole. He's still out with the sheep. But he's being faithful to what God's called him to do. Even though he's been anointed king, he doesn't say... Dad, why am I watching the sheep? I'm king. Let me go be king. He says, nope, I'm going to be faithful. And when God places me, that's where he's got me. And I will pursue doing what's right. And I will pursue your victory, God, over my own. And so when he shows up and he sees Goliath, he says, look, this isn't right. Why are you all standing around when somebody's here making fun of God? Is no one going to stand up and say anything? Is no one going to fight this guy? His heart is, is tuned to the Lord. And you hear that in his, in his phrasing, in his speech, in his actions. He's like, you're making fun of me. You're making fun of my God and all this. And you think it's by your sword that you're going to beat us. That's not what the battle's all about. You got it all upside down in your head. I come to you with God. Don't worry about this little slingshot thing. Don't worry about a sword or whatever. It's not about that. It's about God's power. 
He's a harpist. Say what you want about music and playing and all that, whatever. But I think that speaks to his, uh, his inner peace um, and that he's willing to bring shalom with him to all these different places that he goes, even to the king elect. And you can see that, that depth of character, both in Jonathan and in David, as they pursue this. Saul's king, right? But David, <laughs> the anointed king, that Samuel's already told him, hey, you're going to be king. And he goes and he serves the king. He plays the harp for him when he's bat crazy, throwing spears at him. And David says, look, it's not my place. You're the king. You're the anointed. When you could say, well, David, you're the anointed too. There's a lot of humility there. Okay, so we're, I want to see, uh, I want to show you a couple of a big statements from Samuel. These are kind of the, the mic drop moments. Uh, Samuel says in, in chapter 15, Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. Right? It's not the outward show. It's that heart. Is the heart tuned? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. And this is a little scary. As you read this this week, this is a little scary. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And that's Samuel talking to Saul, and you remember that story. Um, of him doing things his way. But let that sink in a little bit. To obey is better. You've, at this point, they've all got the law. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Follow all the commands. And yet this is, this is the voice of God speaking in. It's like, it's not really all about the sacrifice. It's a symbol that points you towards it's the sign that shows that your heart is there. But it's the heart that I'm after. All right. There's another, another uh, mic drop from Samuel in chapter 12. He says, do not be afraid, Samuel replied. This is uh, his, his uh, speech after they have said, yes, we want a king. Are you sure? Yes, we want a king. All right. Here's your king. But remember, this isn't going to turn out well. I told you, it's really bad, okay? And so he drops to him and he says, uh, don't be afraid. You have done all this evil. And I, and I really, this is, this is good for me because I can stand up here and pretend that I'm good, but I know my heart's wicked. You, listen to this for you. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord. But serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. You could throw in substances in there, right? You could so throw in uh, images or uh, power or money. Don't chase after these things. They're useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people. Because the Lord was pleased to make you his own people, nothing they did. God chose you. Nothing you've done to deserve it or earn it. God loves you that much. He's not going to leave you. And then uh, he says this, as for me, this is Samuel. He's God's anointed. He's the, the, the man that is the, re the reflection of the image of God to the people. He says, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. Turn that heart. 
Make sure that you're listening. And it's an obligation to those that are of us that are in some form of leadership, right? Samuel says, whoa. For me to, to fail to pray for you is sin. That's strong. You don't, you don't hear that taught. Parents, are you praying for your kids? So what's your story? Where are you at in all this? I've got a few of the names up there. I didn't even put Goliath on there. Sorry if that's offensive to you. Uh, but seriously, though, I, I mean, because I could put Goliath up there, but I figure probably if you're here on a Sunday morning, you're probably not just flat out against God. Okay, You're probably not outwardly and inwardly standing in defiance against God. That may be inward, and so maybe I should put Goliath on there, because maybe inwardly you are turned in defiance of the Lord. Well, let's run through a couple of these, and I want to feel like uh, there's some statements that, that go along with each of these characters. And I just want you to, to hear, and then as we go after this, as we go into our groups and we talk um, with each other, this may be helpful for you in your group, this may not. You know, let, let God lead you. Don't worry about what I say. Um, but I want you to chew on some of these thoughts through the week, okay? Um, as you have looked at that list already and have kind of looked down and say, well, yeah, maybe I identify with that person more or this person more or these three people. Um, let's let's uh, talk through just a, a brief of this. Um, maybe you identify with Hannah. Right? God's put you in a tight spot. People mock you. And some even blame God for your situation. God has not rejected you. Take your burden to him. Maybe you identify with Penina. Things are going well. Things are really good. But you can't resist looking down at your neighbor. You can't resist mocking being proud and arrogant. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look with compassion on those around you. Maybe you identify with Eli. You've been placed in leadership and you're honored. But you're placing your company, your organization, your family, above God. Repent. Turn. Turn to the Lord. Place God on the throne in your life. Who do you need to correct? One of Eli's main failings was he didn't correct, right? God comes to him and he confronts him. You and your sons, why are you honoring yourselves over me? Who do you need to correct in love? Who under your supervision needs to be removed? Who needs to be placed into power? What do you need to teach those around you about God? Maybe you, you identify with Hophni and Phinehas. I'm sure I didn't spell, pronounce those right. Are you in the, the next level, kind of that middle level of leadership? Maybe a middle manager? manager? Uh, but you've made it all about what you can get. Have you bought the lie? Are you chasing the dream of money, of power, of prestige? Are you chasing profit and pleasure? You've rejected the voice of your father and your leaders. Stop defrauding. Stop cheating. Treat everyone with respect and dignity. Stop treating the Lord as though he's irrelevant. Return to following the way of the Lord. Or just saying your destruction is coming. Maybe you identify with Samuel. You're seeking the Lord and you're faithful. You're living in the midst of a crooked and depraved environment. 
but pursue the Lord and confront evil with the truth. Call others to righteousness. Keep on being faithful. Have courage. Keep your eyes fixed, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Maybe you identify with Saul. You outwardly, you have it all going great, but your heart's not firmly set on the Lord. You've had great achievements, but you have subtly slid toward listening to what others think. And you care about their voice more than the voice of the Lord. Turn your heart to the Lord and obey. You can't buy God off. You can't. You can't fool him. You can't trick him. He knows. I thought about hiding this morning, and uh, you guys could all try to find me and see if you could hear, discern the voice of the Lord and find me in the baggage, but I opted to, opted to just go ahead and step up here. And, and uh, If you didn't read your, your section, you don't get that joke, but that's okay. <clears throat> but if, you're, if you identify with Saul, what you really need, I mean, if that's you, turn your heart to the Lord and obey. He knows exactly where you are. Turn to the Lord and pursue justice. Maybe Jonathan's more who you are. You have close connections to people in high power. You have authority and you have leadership. You have courage and a good sense of justice and pursue the glory of God. Maintain your connection with the Lord. Resist the pull around you towards evil and even the subtle disobedience. Elevate leaders that have godly character. Challenge leaders that are acting unjustly. Or that pursue their own gain over just what is right. Pursue connections to other people who are godly and have good character. There's a lesson in all of these. David, you've been called to something great, but it's still looming ahead of you. It hasn't been realized yet. You have deep character and integrity. Rise to the challenges that come your way. Don't run away. Don't hide in the shadows or in the baggage. Don't wallow in self-pity that your greatness hasn't been recognized. Be faithful with the little things. God will lift you up in the right time. But for now, stay faithful to what he's called you to do today. Be wise in your interactions with others and always seek the Lord in all your ways. I want to take just a moment and just kind of process through just a little bit of that. You can see that God's calling all of us. I'm going to say it to you. God is calling you to move forward. What is your next step? What is it that God is saying specifically to you How do you need to get your life right? God is faithful to lead us. He's not going to abandon you. I'm going to read to you this again. Samuel told them, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols or profit or pleasure. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, you. Because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, 
far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. I want you guys to know that every week there's a gathering of people that meet just to pray for you. And I mean that, just, just for you, the body of Northridge. There's a gathering of people that prays for each one of you. God knows you. God sees you. God sees the cancer that's invading your body. God sees the heart that's failing. God sees the the broken and the weary. God sees the success and the struggle. He sees you. Don't turn away. I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to dismiss into our groups. If you don't know where your group is, or if you don't have a specific group, grab hold of one. It doesn't matter. Seek other godly people to be around. God, thank you. Thank you that you pursue us so diligently. Thank you that you don't lead us, leave us in rebellion, that you don't leave us in our brokenness. Thank you that you are the God of healing. That you are the God who sees us. God, give us the strength to be faithful. Thank you for these that have gathered here. Help us to love you well. In Jesus' name, amen.